This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website. Uh, well, uh, good evening. My name is Scott Anthony. I'm a co-convener of the Public History Seminar. And um, the thing about the seminar is it's not just about history for the widest public, it's also history by the public. And to that end, we want to make this as a participative a session as possible. We've taken um, some questions in the week, or on Twitter, or on email, what have you, and I want to put those questions to uh, Peter and Oliver uh, in, 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 in the, the 40 minutes or so we have. And also, of course, I want to take questions from you, as many questions as possible. Uh, I'm going to give you five minutes to uh, think up some questions, and then have some roving mics. Um, but whilst you're thinking of those questions, uh, I'm going to sort of abuse the privilege of the chair. I it would be really useful, actually. This is blocking your visual. <laughs> you have to think about how they can how see they you. Can they don't want to see a bottle. <laughs> well, <clears throat> well uh, is that better? The microphones are bad enough. Can you see us? <laughs> the light's pretty dim, but that's nice. Um, so it feels like we're in a science class for uh, Charles Darwin sort of thing. As long as we don't blow up the laboratory, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. Um, I, I suppose it would be really nice just to know a little bit about the genesis of the project, how you met, uh, what, what you were trying to do, how, how you came together. Briefly, uh, uh, are we going to take questions at some point? Yes, right. So yes. Obviously, you can follow up on what you like. Is this fine? Yes. For the back? Oh, can you hear? Yeah. No, uh, I met Peter in 1996 at the American University. He, he teaches history and is the director of the Nuclear Institute of Studies. He, uh, his specialty has been nuclear war, and which really is a dull subject, it seems, at times. But frankly, I wasn't that interested in it. But he brought me there for a class at American uh, University for History. He was teaching in my films, all the films uh, that were, were historical. Very popular class, apparently. We went out to dinner, and uh, I asked him idly, you know, about to tell me a little bit about the atomic bomb because I knew he'd bore me. Because, frankly, in America, we don't follow that subject anymore. It's accepted. It happened. We dropped the bomb to end the war. Japan surrendered uh, based on that on that bomb, and that was the end of World War One, uh, World War Two. So it was a very clear uh, American narrative of triumphalism. Peter put a twist into it and said, no, you ever heard of Henry Wallace? And he put this Hitchcockian twist into this great story of the Italian bomb. He made it interesting and personalized it because Wallace was invested in preventing that bomb from being misused. And indeed, like a Frankenstein's monster, it became, uh, it became, it was dropped very quickly and without thought by Truman and his gang in the 45. Great story and how to tell it. It became obsession, obsessive, and 12 years go by. I want to do something about Wallace. It doesn't quite happen. I come to him after the George Bush uh, interregnum of eight years, and I'm really depressed. <laughs> I'm really depressed. I mean, it seems like, what's the point? What am I going to be here for? I can't make another movie like this. I have to simply try to put it all together into one movie, which is a documentary that would go from 1945 to now, or basically 1940 to now, my era and I would leave it for my children. And that was the initial impulse. And Peter uh, was the nursemaid. You want to explain your own? Well, uh, I'll start by contradicting Oliver. Uh, in 1996, when I told Oliver the story about Henry Wallace and the atomic bomb and the origins of the Cold War, that was right after the Enola Gay controversy in the United States. Oliver says people didn't want to talk about the atomic bomb. It had roiled academia in the United States when the Smithsonian uh, canceled the exhibit, which was because it was challenging the traditional narrative about the atomic bomb. This was a huge issue in the United States and really throughout academia. So there was a lot of interest in the atomic bomb, actually, but the difficulty of presenting the kind of narrative that you saw in our documentary in America's official museums said that the United States was not yet ready to deal seriously and honestly and critically with its own past. And so the American Legion and the Air Force Association intervened and the Congress threatened to cut off funding to the Smithsonian as the Smithsonian went ahead with that Enola Gay exhibit. Then finally, in 2003, they display the plane at the annex to, the, to this uh, Air and Space Museum, the Uvar Hazy Annex, and General John Jack Daly, the head of the Air and Space Museum, says we're going to display the Enola Gay 
in all of its glory as a magnificent technological achievement. So if you go there now, you see it being displayed, but in a very, very uncritical, unthinking way, without any of this history, without any of this context. But Oliver and I began this friendship and collaboration back in 1996, and then it blossomed over the years. In 2008, we spent five years working on this project. So you saw episode three. We also have an 800-page book that we wrote as part of this to give a lot of the background, the documents, the evidence, so that people can see why we're saying what we're basing this on, and uh, to give that background. Um, thanks. Uh I have two more questions before I'm going to open up to the uh, to the audience. Uh, and, um, and and firstly, is, is the obvious question in a sense that it's it, it's a polemical series and a polemical book, and um, sets itself up as a corrective to correct you know, biases uh, in, in the mainstream American media in particular. Um, and I'm just uh, curious uh, to Peter how your sort of peers in academia have. have have responded in a sense because it's, it's something that humanity scholars are perhaps often squeamish about, rightly or wrongly. And and, and uh, to Oliver, in a sense, just to pick up what you said there in terms of did you see this in a sense as a new project or a new step into a new field? Because it does strike me that so much of your sort of film career is about the untold history of the United States, you know, back to, to Salvador in a sense. And, you know, on the one hand, this is a Gonzo History Channel project, on the other hand, it seems a sort of continuing theme of your work. I like that, Gonzo history. I do. I really like it. We'll get back to that. Go ahead. What you have to understand to understand the response in academia is that the United States, among historians, the historical profession moved pretty sharply to the left by the 1970s. A lot of the people who were active in the new left went into academia, and history, the traditional view of history that we saw in the 50s and 60s and 40s, begins to be challenged in the 1970s. And that's when we have the new social history, the influence of E.P. Thompson, you've got history from the bottom up beginning in the 1970s and 1980s, and the kind of that progressive view became really hegemonic uh, in, among historians in the United States. So the response from historians has been quite positive. Uh, there have been some who are the old style Cold War liberals who don't like it and some who are more conservative don't like it but the response from my colleagues has been very very positive uh, the response from mainstream media has been more critical because they do not know the world of academia they don't know the challenge to the traditional narrative and so what we're doing throughout we're challenging the idea of American exceptionalism we're challenging the notion of the American empire as a force for good in the world unmitigatedly. We're challenging the necessity for a national security state. We, begin in 2000, we began this project in 2008 looking at trying to say to the American public that Iraq and Afghanistan, those two disastrous invasions of the, that period, were not aberrations, that they were part of this continuum of American history going back to the 1890s, and we wanted to show that, so we lay it out, the recurrent patterns. Uh, uh, to keep to keep it on the personal level, my own involvement with this, uh, the I made a movie about Bush called W. Uh, it was a lighter portrait of a man, but I think you saw there was quite a bit of malice, uh, there was quite a bit of satire and malice in my portrait of him. However, uh, the justice of what Bush did is a much bigger story, uh, and uh, we had to deal with that in this history. So the idea was to include this ongoing corruption of the, what I would call the global national, the global security state, which was established really by the Pentagon after World War II and grew and grew. Even when our enemies, the Soviet Union, uh, fell off the map, or actually called it, called it off, called the Cold War off, we kept going, we never stopped. Uh, we kept going into the sands of Saudi Arabia with the invasion of Kuwait. We put the most amount of American troops ever since Vietnam into the Middle East, which was insane. Stirring up passions of all kinds in Saudi Arabia, the Mecca. Uh, it, 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 we're in clumsy moves and uh, outwardly, uh, geographic, geographically dictated by, I believe, a desire for oil, gas, control, Control is more important than any single wealth, and that is the key uh, to dominate the region, the Middle East. So that led off into this new period with 2001, 
We never stopped. That's my point. And this military, industrial, financial state uh, has only expanded for the worse. But seeing this for my children is very, could be very, I think the best thing I can do at this point, because I woke up late in my life, I was 40 years old when I actually went back to uh, Central America and saw with my own eyes the behavior in the 1980s of the Reagan people and the troops that we had there and the attitude toward the, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua and the, the, the support we gave to the, to the madness, the dictators and the death squads that were wiping out and oppressing the poor people of these regions. Uh, and not even being able to get away with calling it communist, serious communist anymore. So this, uh, this, this made me say, and I said to myself, look, I'm a little bit stupid here. I saw this in Vietnam, I was ashamed of it, but I never really saw it so clearly as I threw redux the second time in Central America. That sent me off onto a commitment to make progressive films, but none of them could match the overall picture that was, I couldn't do it, the overall unheard, untold story with the generation of uh, Tolstoyan people. It would be a nice idea, you know, it would be a great idea to do 1940 to now, but it's a quite, quite a big work. But to do it in a documentary seemed feasible. Little did I know it would not take two years, it would take five, and it would go over budget, and it would be very difficult. But Because I tried to do it with my left hand to begin, and I found that it needed my right hand, too. So uh, frankly, uh, I learned a lot in the last few years, but I'm just trying to say that I came late to these I came late in my life. I was a conservative, raised conservative. I, I fought in Vietnam as a patriot. I believed in, the, in what America was doing. I never questioned it. I never, I, never, I never even questioned the atomic bomb. And when you start to go there and you start to question that first thing, that founding myth of our republic, the, uh, the atom bomb, you essentially open up Pandora's box. Uh, it'll never go back. All, the, all these things that happened will, go, will never go back into that box and be easily explained as the end of World War II. And it sets up a vastly alternative history, but you start with the atomic bomb. Okay. I think uh, probably the best thing is to, to start taking some questions from the audience. Uh, we have two roaming mics. Where, where are they? Uh, perhaps we could go to the right side of the room first, and then we'll take three questions together. Please try and keep your questions succinct and to the point so we can get through as many as possible. So um, if there's any questions over here, please raise your hand. Okay, so do you want to take one, two, three? Yeah. Hi, I'm taking in uh, tweets for the IHR Public History Seminar. So I have one in from Nick Blackburn, who's a PhD history student at St. Andrews University, and he asks a public history question. How do you balance in these kind of popular formats the need to entertain with the complexity of the past? So the question was, how do you balance the need to entertain and the complexity of the past? Let's take two more questions. I was wondering if uh, Oliver subscribed to the belief of uh, New World Order and, um, well, yeah, um, essentially that to stop things off. Uh, do the panel subscribe to the belief in the New World Order? And coming down to the middle, do you, do you want to take them? Hi there. Um, I guess I'm interested in, in what gave you, uh, how you decided on each segment. In the, in the series of documentaries. So was it was it the actual um, tangible untold stories themselves, or was it um, you were interested in in a specific sequence of events and you were looking for those untold stories within those events? Okay, and how did you uh, break the series down into discrete well, one, uh, Question one and three tie together, so I'll try to answer it briefly. It is the most difficult thing to do, is to make a documentary exciting. <laughs> Uh, most except documentaries, uh, most, uh, they have improved, I think, quite a bit in recent years, but most are, tend to, uh, to be boring or to go to a lot of uh, talking head interviews where you're making the point, I think, sometimes repeatedly. I was very impressed with the British series uh, World at War, 1970s, two, three, Jeremy Isaacs, 26 hours, although it's vastly, uh, I think, unbalanced on the Soviet issue, I think it's a magnificent series that proved that you can make a long form 26 hours of one subject and keep an audience over
over time, not just in the present season, but over 30, 40, 50 years. I would like this series to be out there in the next uh, 20 years and be able to come back and talk about it and see what was wrong and in hindsight or what was right. This is a form of inquisition. So to make that inquisition exciting, in other words, I'm learning, you're, and hopefully some of the audience is learning, is the key to this thing. And you make the music, you have movie clips where you need them, and you, you cut free associatively to images that you think might be apropos, someone in the style of Adam Curtis, who's been much criticized for it, but so what? He broke barriers. He made us think in new terms. We, we, the, the book is available. You can read the book separately from the uh, movie, and you will have a, it, it's a different experience. When you see a movie, you're in that movie for that moment, and uh, I hope you saw a sense of it today, the drama, the build-up. We start out with a thesis, we, then there's a counterattack, and then often the synthesis and we all do that in 58 minutes and 30 seconds to the second. Um, the narration is the result of much rewriting. The narration has been simplified from an extensive, extensive amount of subject matter. So I think where is the line? You find the line every time. When people start to fall asleep watching it, that's your answer. When people are awake watching it and are provoked, that's your answer. So. It's a very subjective thing, but I love exciting documentaries. But as long as, in this case, we were fact-checked to death. There's no question we lost a lot of time with changes and fact-checks. We had uh, separate fact-checks from Showtime, from CBS Legal, and ourselves. We had one from uh, our group. Uh, as to the second question, which was about... Uh, uh, about yeah, what, the new world segment. The new world order. Just briefly, I would say that I associate that terminology with... Uh, George Bush, the father, uh, in the 1980s, uh, when he went into Kuwait uh, and Saudi Arabia, which is even a bigger offense, and called this sort of the, the end of the Vietnam syndrome, syndrome and the beginning of the New World Order. It has very negative associations to me, and I know that it unleashed 20 more years of unfettered capitalism, where the banks and the IMF tried to run the world alongside this new world order, and it seems to have been a disaster because worse things happened after the Soviet Empire fell than any time during the Soviet Empire, possibly, with the possible exception of the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, the Berlin Wall and the oppressions we saw, not only in the Eastern Europe, but the oppressions we saw in the third world countries by the US. So uh, what happened with the Arab world and the fundamentalism that we trained and encouraged in Afghanistan the, uh, the, the concept of sending American combat troops in large, in large numbers to the Middle East has been a disaster. The blowback, it was apparent on 2001, it, it was blowback, it wasn't because we were, it wasn't because they hated us for our freedoms and it wasn't a monumental battle between good and evil as George Bush called it, it was because we had troops in Saudi Arabia and we had an Israeli policy that really made them very upset. And uh, a lot of stems from those two issues as well as other issues. So we don't hear, we don't listen, we don't react. New world order, I don't, I don't think it worked. I think we're in trouble because of the currency crisis and the financial crisis, right? very much so. And there are cycles that are speeding up. I don't see how the new world order can last, nor should it, because this is essentially a, a white hegemon. Well, Oliver answered it pretty well, I think. Uh, Hegemon, I'm sorry. Hegemon. But the, uh, let me just add that the New World Order, the period since the end of the Cold War, has been a period of American domination in a way that never existed before. The United States was really the only superpower. We've been the policemen of the world. We've been dictating, throwing our weight around in ways that don't work anymore. So uh, even Robert Gates, Secretary of Defense and head of the CIA, said if any president invades another country like we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, he should have his head examined. Well, Douglas MacArthur had said that to Jack Kennedy back in the 1960s. We didn't learn the lesson then. Perhaps we're learning it now. Not only can we not afford it, you know how much money we wasted in this war on terror? According to Joseph Stieglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist and Laura Bilmes, that the actual cost has already been four tr or will it be $4 trillion when all the medical benefits come, are, are counted up. Uh, so $4 trillion, we could have done a lot of good in the world with $4 trillion. What have we accomplished in Iraq and Afghanistan? We've uh, disrupted uh, traditional societies. 
Uh, we spent in, two, in 2010, we spent $100 billion on the military in Afghanistan, $2 billion on development. What's the life expectancy there? With something like 47 years, the literacy rate, 10, 15 percent. I mean, this is a country that really needs development aid. Uh, what have we delivered instead? We've increased the corruption. We've increased the, uh, well, we've disrupted society there. We go in blindly. We get warned beforehand what the consequences can be, and we ignore them. You've got presidents who invade these countries. George Bush didn't know the difference between the Sunnis and the Shiites. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a level of ignorance. Uh, the China experts were driven out of the State Department during the McCarthy period. So, of course, we go into Vietnam. We know nothing about Vietnamese history. We didn't, nobody spoke the language. We, we invade countries cavalierly. We don't even have the level of knowledge that the British had. At least the British had some knowledge of, of the countries that they were conquering and, and dominating. The Americans didn't even, Americans didn't, ha didn't even have that when we, when we go into these places. Peter, can I just ask you to, to pick up the question about choice of historical events? Because it does seem one of the sort of interesting tensions in the series is between this sort of systematic critique of the American security state, but also kind of portraits of people you might not have heard before, like Wallace. Uh, do do and people know? So, they're, so, they're, so in a sense, you know, there, there is this kind of you know, dichotomy in it between kind of having kind of not really goodies and baddies, but you know, there are villains of the piece and there are unsung heroes. And yet there is also this attempt to apply this sort of systematic view of America. And that, that is an interesting editorial we started off with the idea that we were going to explain how the United States went so far wrong by 2008. And we wanted to challenge these fundamental assumptions that American kids just get in their schools, they get from television, this assumption about America's benighted sense of entitlement and this arrogant attitude. Um, and so we looking for a pattern. We're trying to find the patterns that go on throughout. We start with 1890s. Why 1890s? Because in 1898, in the Spanish-American War, the United States goes through a transformation. Up to that point, the United States had been fairly sympathetic to revolution and reform around the world and progressive forces. In 1899, we invade the Philippines. We overthrow the Aguinaldo government popular movement there. Uh, and the United States begins to make the shift from being the world's uh, progressive force to being the world's leading counter-revolutionary force. We continue that in the interventions over and over again in Latin America. Uh, then, after the co when the Cold War begins, or right after World War II, the Cold War was not inevitable. Roosevelt didn't think that there was going to be enmity between the United States and the Soviets. Roosevelt foresaw a period of friendship between the United States and the Soviet Union. Churchill was a little bit more dubious, of course, but Churchill was out of power by, during Potsdam by July 1945. Uh, Anthony Eden was furious. He gave an interview uh, in 1946 with Robert Sherwood in which he expressed his fury toward Churchill and Truman for creating this mess with the Soviet Union. And he said, had Roosevelt lived, that would not have happened. That's why we bring in Henry Wallace in such a prominent way. Do people know Henry Wallace? Is he a familiar figure? Because usually, usually when, I, uh, when we do this one, I, I give a little introduction beforehand to set up Henry Wallace, because if you had seen our first two episodes, you would know Henry Wallace. But Wallace was Roosevelt's vice president from 41 to 45. You saw his Century of the Common Man speech. And Henry Luce in 1941, the head of the Time Life Empire, says the 20th century must be the American century. The U.S. will dominate the world. Wallace responds, says the 20th century must be the century of the common man. He calls for a worldwide people's revolution. He was a visionary, and he was Roosevelt's vice president. And then there's what's called Pauli's coup, run by the treasurer of the Democratic Party, to throw, Rose to throw Wallace off the ticket. They knew that Roosevelt was getting sick, that he would not last another term, that whoever was vice president would become the next president of the United States. And Wallace was enormously popular. The week the Democratic Party convention started, July 20th, 1944, uh, Gallup released a poll asking potential voters who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% said they wanted Wallace back as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. Uh, Wallace was the second most popular American at the time. Uh, so they engineered this coup with the party bosses to get him off the ticket. But in the midst of that, during the convention, Claude Pepper, the senator from Florida, got five feet from the microphone to put Wallace's name in nomination before the bosses forced the adjournment. Had Pepper gotten those five more feet, we show, 
then Wallace would have been back on the ticket, it would have swept the convention that night, and we argue that there would have been no atomic bomb and very possibly no Cold War. If it was one, it would have taken a very, very different form than it did. So we're trying to find those moments where history twists, where those, those, those hinges, where, where the doors of history turn and, and uh, where things could have been different. And that was one of those key moments in 1944 and 1945. But we, we point to a lot of other ones as well because we want to give people a sense of hope also. The stuff is very bleak about the atomic bombing, the Cold War, the wars that we're pointing out. But we also know that, that things are hopeful, that there are social movements, social forces that also push history in certain directions. And there are also visionary leaders in the United States has had some who've tried to take our country in different directions. They haven't unfortunately su succeeded, and some of them have been changed, but, uh, but change is possible and different directions are possible. I think we should take some more questions. Um, if we perhaps take the gentleman at the back, and then if you come down to, to the well, we'll take three again. Firstly, can I just say thank you very much for a fantastic film and brilliant project. Two questions. The first is, are you really suggesting that Stalin had absolutely no interest in occupying Eastern Europe as much of Western Europe as possible. No. And it was simply because of the atomic bomb no. that he did that, firstly. And secondly, you as historians know what the Japanese were thinking. Um, you have the advantage of knowing what was happening in Manchuria. What evidence do you have that the man you regard as the criminal in this, Harry Truman, knew the evidence rather than having to make a hard and very difficult political judgment? If it's a judgment question, it's very easy for historians to criticize, but in the heat of the moment, faced by the alternative, he either had to invade with American troops or he had to drop the atomic bomb. Do you know that he and his advisors were aware that the Japanese were about to surrender? Can, can we just answer that? Yes, that's, sure. that's, that's pretty, Those are pretty loaded questions, so rather than go on to the other things, uh, let, me, let me start with the second one, and then we'll get to the first. What did Truman know at the time? Truman was in a very difficult position. He had been vice president for 82 days. Roosevelt had, spoke, had met with him twice and spoke about nothing of substance. Truman's level of knowledge was so low, and people had so little respect for him, that as vice president for 82 days, nobody even bothered to tell him we were building an atomic bomb. That is an astounding fact. Nobody, uh, Truman was not a well-respected person. In 1934, when the Pendergast machine that runs Kansas City decides to run him for the Senate, the newspapers asked Pendergast, boss Pendergast, why'd you pick Harry Truman of all people? And Pendergast said, I wanted to show the world that a well-oiled machine could take an office boy and get him elected to the Senate. Truman was not some towering figure. In fact, when, he, when Roosevelt dies on April 12th, everybody Truman meets with for the next two weeks says, this is a terrible mistake. I'm not big enough. I'm not smart enough. I shouldn't be president. We should get somebody who can handle the job. So we're sympathetic to Truman in a certain sense that he had to face the most monumental, difficult decisions with very little background and with all the wrong advisors. So, so we're, we're sensitive to that. Uh, what is Truman know. Truman knows that if you look at the intelligence reports from April on, they say repeatedly that the only, that first, uh, two things. First of all, we know that the obstacle to surrender is the, keeping the emperor. As MacArthur Southwest Command says, uh, that the uh, hanging of the emperor to them would be like the crucifixion of Christ to us. All will fight to die like ants. We knew that that was it. And his own people in his own War Department and State Department were urging him to tell the Japanese they could keep the emperor. Otherwise, they would not surrender. It was Jimmy Burns who almost single-handedly resisted that, number one. But Truman knew that and was told that repeatedly. Number two, on the question of what would end the war. If you look at the April 11th report of the Joint Intelligence Staff to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is repeated in July 2nd, and that was, it come out, comes out a number of times, they say that the, uh, that the entry of the Soviet Union into the war will convince all Japanese that defeat is inevitable. They say this over, uh, the, well, we intercept the Japanese cables. We were intercepting them from the start of the war, and if you look at the cables beginning in May, it says that the Japanese Supreme War Council understands that the Soviet entry will deal a death blow to the Japanese Japanese emperor. And that's what they say. That, well, now, what does Truman know? Truman was getting briefed on this. Truman refers to the July 18th cable as the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Those are Truman's words. Truman says after meeting with Stalin,
Stalin, he said, I went to Potsdam for one main reason, to make sure the Russians are coming into the war. After Truman meets with Stalin, he writes, he writes in his journal, Stalin will be in the Jap war August 15th, finny Japs when that happens. He writes to his wife the next day, and he says, the Russians are coming in, think of it, the war, the war will end the year sooner now, think of all the boys who won't be killed. We've got evidence after evidence of Truman's attitude, not only Truman, but everybody around him, because they were reading the cables. They knew that. They knew that, which is why six of the seven five-star generals and admirals uh, who, who got their fifth star during the war are on record as having said the atomic bombing was either militarily unnecessary or morally unjustified or reprehensible or both. Because they knew what was going on at that point. They knew how close the Japanese were to surrendering. And we've got a lot more evidence than that. Read the book, you'll see a lot of the evidence. Because we know that Truman was in a difficult position, but we also know that the atomic bomb was not in any way militarily necessary. Let me give you one piece there that you saw. Douglas MacArthur, who we don't think of as a leading uh, uh, pacifist, right? <laughs> Douglas MacArthur said that the, uh, that the Japanese, if we told them they could keep the emperor, they would have surrendered in May and happily. I think that's a little exaggerated. I don't think they would have surrendered in May, possibly in June, almost certainly in July, if they knew, as people warned, as people said, that the, that the Soviets were coming into the war, that they could keep the emperor, and that we had this horrible new weapon. Now, those three, I think, almost certainly would have brought the end of the war without use of the atomic bomb. Uh, just a practical point, just about dates, because it, it occurs to me when you really get beyond the skin of events and all the cables, you, I mean, the Americans could not move on Japan until November. That was the operation that was planned. Right. That was August uh, 6, September, October, November, three months. We can't lose mass casualties for three months. The Japanese are essentially blockaded. The Soviets are already moving on August 9th. They're making fast strides. They wreck the Japanese Kwangtung army, which is a million, almost almost a million men. That was a huge number. The Soviets were deadly, deadly force, and they had been trained in war, and they were brutal, as the Japanese know. They could see their women being raped. They could see the the emperor being crucified. They were killed by, like they did Tsar Nicholas. The Japanese knew the Russians were much more uh, ruthless force in the U.S. So that that quick changed their mind quickly to make the deal with the U.S. In fact, Peter points to the fact, I think it's very interesting, that the Japanese didn't even know that they were really nuclear bombed on August 6th because they'd been so bombed by the fire bombs over that last uh, nine months. Yeah. Okay, that's... Uh, would you like... Oh, Stalin. Sure. Uh, we, don't, we don't say that uh, the Stalin occupied Eastern Europe because the atomic bomb, if you study your history, you'll know that the Soviets were already in Eastern Europe at that point. As John Lewis Gaddis points out, uh, the United States didn't give up anything at Yalta to Stalin that he didn't already have. So the question is, it would be an interesting discussion to get into why we held up the Second Front and how that affected the tide of the war and why that allowed Stalin to progress so as far as he did, as fast as he did. That's another interesting question. Stalin wanted Eastern Europe as a buffer zone. Why did he want Eastern Europe as a buffer zone? Because the Soviet Union had been invaded twice through Eastern Europe by Germany. The Soviets feared Germany more than anything, and they do much longer than that. Uh, and so, but if you look at the actual timing of when he puts down these repressive dictatorships in Eastern Europe, most of that doesn't happen until 1947 and 1948. What we're arguing is that there was a period between 1944 and 1946, 1947, if you'd had a different approach toward the Soviet Union, they would, those governments there would have been repressive in Eastern Europe. They would have retained that area. They wanted a buffer zone. They would have been repressive governments, but they would not, would not become lockstep dictatorships until 1947, 1948. And I think Soviets wanted to we're counting on a friendly relationship with the United States after the war. And from Greece and the British. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, story. it's a slightly different issue, though, uh, because Oliver's referring to the October 1944 meeting between Churchill and Stalin, where they have their 70% here, 55% here, and how important it was to Churchill. He's willing to give up. He says, okay, you can have uh, 75, 80%, 90% influence in Eastern Europe, but I want Greece. You know, and, that, so, and, and, and then he later says, Stalin never broke his word to me. You know, he promised this, and, and he never broke his word to me. They, had Stalin been a revolutionary, 
of any sort, he would have supported the resistance forces in Greece. He turns a blind eye to the resistance forces in Greece and lets Churchill reimpose the monarchy there, his right-wing forces. With force. Yes, they, the slaughter. The streets. And, and in the, as Albert was saying, in the United States in 1944, there was much more opposition to the British going into Greece than there was to the Russians going into Poland. Okay, should we take uh, the, the gentleman in the well here, and then we'll come Dive forward in the streets. to yeah. uh, uh, the gentleman next opposite, and then perhaps down to the front here. Okay, uh, my question is for Mr. Stone. I know you served in the Vietnam War, and you said at the age of 40 is when you awoke to everything that, that you, uh, that's going on now. Um, I'm 26 years old. At the age of 18, two weeks after high school, I joined the Air Force because uh, I had a sense of uh, obligation and duty to my country. Uh, eight years later, I think, is when I fairly uh, awoke as well after seeing documentaries such as uh, Most Dangerous Man in America, uh, South Border, uh, lots of the stuff you've done as well, and just watching your interviews. Back then, it was, it, I, I was oblivious to everything that's going on, and that's the way I think kids are nowadays. I told my cousin, who's actually a history teacher, he should be you know, showing stuff like this to his students, any type of documentary that challenges our history, but he said he'd get fired. Yet he can have a Marine recruiter go in there and tell, you know, pump them up for war that they shouldn't be fighting or dying for in the first place. How else do you think we should uh, bring this type of awareness to uh, America's youth? Oh, uh, you sound American? <laughs> yeah, yeah too, I'm American, oh. yes. Yeah. One, two, three. Well, uh, yeah. Well, can we take can we take two other questions before we come back to that? So, okay. I'm uh, Professor James Woodhouse, and I write for Spike. I wondered, uh, Oliver, first of all, if I could congratulate you not only on a, a, a beautifully spoken documentary, but lots of new stuff with which many people are uh, unfamiliar. I think I would quarrel with you with some of your old categories: military, industrial, and now financial complex and oil and gas. But I think in the spirit of learning, if I can turn to uh, Peter, I was surprised that you put forward as much as you did the Hiroshima case uh, as being something a feint against the Soviet Union. I'm familiar with Gar Alperovitz's work on this question and it's, it's a very familiar com uh, com concept like the military industrial concept uh, complex. And <clears throat> I, I put it to you that the early part of your film, when you ascribe racial origins to the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki thing, could have been given more weight. And I think the wider concept that would be newer and what might take the discussion forward is, don't you think that both Wallace and Truman were in a search for legitimation of America, particularly and American capitalism, particularly at a time when fascism had discredited it so much? And in that cause, Truman wanted to represent the Soviet Union as totalitarian and fascist in the Cold War. And Wallace was concerned with legitimation from below, so to speak, to have a peaceful capitalism and imperialism. For his pains, I believe his supporters were back and charged on the streets. But isn't that a chimera? Wasn't he misguided in believing that you could reform such a, such a state at that time, and isn't that quest for legitimacy part of the equation yeah. of the origins of the Cold War? Well, uh, sorry, can we take the, one more question? And then we'll come back to the I forgot all my good ideas. Hi, <laughs> you're all right. Um, just uh, linking both things out slightly, um, I thought it was great to see the uh, footage, and I think it's absolutely brilliant that you managed to get Wayne Gow to do the narration. Um, I'm thinking back to the first question there. Um, as regards uh, inputting uh, an alternative history of America into the homes of everybody on a weekly basis now, is this another way of bringing a war home? Okay. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just repeat those three questions. The first one is to do with uh, raising uh, consciousness of uh, uh, old sort of hidden American history in America and in schoolrooms. The second question uh, is about. Um, was some of the idealism essentially misguided? <laughs> and uh, the last question there was was about the war is coming home. What war is coming home? Well, well, it's a sort of like a boomerang effect, I think. We're saying. Oh yeah. You're talking about blowback. 
uh, which I think is no, what. No. No, 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 no. I was talking about bringing a war back. You're recreating a history or rewriting a history for people to look at, oh, yeah. as right. that has been done previously. And I'm just wondering if that is a new way in the new millennium, 2013. I'm, sure. I'm just saying that um, as you're producing a new history, or a rewritten or a reworking of a history, and pointing out its faults with its history, you are now through CBS or, or Sky Atlantic or whatever going to inject that into the least home in America. Is this a new way of bringing the war home? This is a, this is a, a form of change, isn't it, that you're trying to instill in American culture? <laughs> Same as the young man back there. Can you answer that? Yeah. Okay, can I, I just, I, I'd like just to go back to number two for a second. Well, I remember what I was going to say. <laughs> in the same, my answer, and I only can answer part of your question, I'm going to leave the rest to Peter. Uh, we know Gar, we saw Gar the other night too, and uh, he's a wonderful man, and so is uh, and, uh, Leffler, uh, what's his Marty name? Marty Sherwin. What's his name? Marty Sherwin, Marty Sherwin. Yeah, he was there too. But listen, uh, you know, you, you talk about the, 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 uh, the, the way the world worked. And that I was trying to point out about the Hiroshima story, about the, it was three months, we were three months away from invading. The, the Russians were much closer. It was scary in the Japanese. I don't think the situation would remain the same for three months because the United States would have ended up having to say, using the Russian troops, helping them to embark into Japan. Because it would have been a lot less, that we would have had no casualties. The Russian army was, in, was practically invincible at that time. So why not use the Russians? Why even have one American casualty? That is a cynical attitude, but it, it makes sense. And it was doable because the Russians were moving. Okay, so that's a very practical solution. You, you understand there's no American casualties that are ever going to happen if you let the Russians do their job. Do you understand? We're allies, right? Does that make sense to you? That nothing could happen? Anyway, I, well, I'm not going to be rhetorical here, but the, in the issue of the Cold War, what happened? We had the two sides, whoever blames who, aggressed, raised the, 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 the noise in the room, and there was this freezing of relations and a lack of communication, above all, lack of communication. It died out. There was no way to get to Stalin. Stalin, there was no way for him to get to Truman. They just froze. And what, what happened as a result? The uh, Soviets completely froze up on Eastern Europe. They took over eventually. And they, and they made many people's lives very miserable for a long time. It was a desire for freedom. That was a horrible way to end this thing, to end World War II. It froze a huge population in place. What was the other solution? What is the other practical solution? Why did we have to go to that place where we couldn't even talk? I'm saying even maintaining some communication, being angry about this and that, as Rothfeld said, doesn't. All these problems could be solved. Every single one of these problems could be solved, and that is not allowed to be. So here is a case where practical communication, keeping talking to your, not freezing it up, works, and the people of Eastern Europe and the people of America would be a lot better off because we wouldn't have militarized to where we became an insane, over, over paranoid, over militarized uh, military industrial complex under Eisenhower so quickly. There's so many places to jump in. I'll, I'll pick up on what Oliver's saying right now. So Roosevelt dies April 12th. Truman's first day of office is April 13th. He meets with Molotov on April 23rd. And, and in that 10 day period, the whole re the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union has flipped already by that April 23rd meeting with Molotov. And Truman later brags afterwards, says, I gave it to him one two to the jaw. He said beforehand, uh, I only expect to be able to get 85% of what I'm demanding from him. And he goes there and he accuses Molotov and the Soviets of having broken all of their agreements. He knew nothing about what he was talking about, but this was the Harriman line. Harriman flies back from Russia and to, to brief him. The cabinet was split on these, on these issues. Stimson and Marshall and others thought that this kind of approach was crazy. But Truman didn't know and he was, being, he was making up for his lack of knowledge by this bluster, this bravado, this tough guy stuff that Truman so... Uh, guilty of, which backfires. It's, it's just the wrong thing. So what Oliver's saying is we had a period of friendship that could have lasted, we could have worked out the differences, or we could have tried at least. And if we had failed, maybe that would have happened too. But we don't even make the effort. We, we stigmatize them and we alienate them very, very quickly. Then there's some attempts to move back a little, but the mistrust there is, is, is very, very deep. 
Uh, on the question, Professor Woodhouse, uh, in regard to the Soviet issue, if we look at the words of the main advisors on the bomb decision, Leslie Groves, Leslie Groves, who's chair of the Manhattan Project, Brigadier General Groves, said, from two weeks after I took over this project, I approached it as if the Russians were our enemy, the Soviets were our enemy, not the Japanese. Uh, from the very beginning, Burns, and Jimmy Burns becomes the leading advisor. Burns flies up from South Carolina on April 13th, and Truman says, tell me about the world. I know nothing about any of these agreements or what's going on. And he says there, I'm going to make you my main advisor from behind the scenes, and then I can get rid of Statinius. You'll become my secretary of state. Uh, three leading scientists, Walter Bartke, Leo Zillard, and Harold Urey, went to see Truman. Truman sends him down to South Carolina to meet with Burns. And that discussion was fascinating. Z Burns says, so Zillard, they're trying to convince Burns not to use the bomb. And, Zillard, and Burns says to Zillard, you're Hungarian, aren't you? Don't you want to get the Russians out of Hungary? And he starts talking about using the bomb to get the Russians out of Eastern Europe. Right from there, and Burns is the main influence. But the other thing about it was that this, the Japanese had a really stupid strategy. And that was to try to get the Soviets to intervene on their behalf to get them better surrender terms. And they say in, the, in their, their, their official statements, if the Soviets come in, we're finished. We're done. So they want to keep the Soviets out of the war, and they want to get, they're going to give the Soviets concessions in order to get better surrender terms. The Soviets had no intention, obviously, of negotiating on behalf of the, the Japanese. But it's the Soviets who know more than anybody that the Japanese are trying to surrender and are defeated. When uh, Hirota, the Japanese foreign prime minister, meets with the Soviet ambassador, Malik, in Tokyo in, in May, Malik tells uh, the Kremlin that they're desperate to end the war, that they want to end the war. The Soviets knew that. And so when the Soviets see the United States drop the bomb, they're the ones who, who immediately say it's dropped on us. Stalin and Stalin's leading advisors know that they're the real target or believe that they're the real target. And the scientists warned that that would be the case. Uh, if you look at the Frank Committee report. So there's a lot of evidence to support the Gar Alperovitz interpretation, which we accept. Now, is Truman, the Truman is so clear-headed? I mean, Truman's confused. This is not a great intellect, really. Uh, and, and, and Truman was confused about a lot of things during this period. And, and Truman, on one hand, believes maybe this is going to speed up the end of the war, which he wanted also, without having to let the Japanese keep the emperor. But the irony, of course, is that we let them keep the emperor anyway. And Secretary of War Stimson said, it's in the US interest. We have to let them keep the emperor, or else there's not going to be any stability in Japan after the war. So that was in our interest. But we, we don't do that until August. 10th or 11th, after this all, all occurs. So from the, the Soviets ha have an understanding of what this is, and they have a sense of American ruthlessness, because they believe the war is ending, and that this was absolutely unnecessary. Could, could I just uh, pick up the, the other two questions there, in yeah. terms of uh, alternative understandings of contemporary American history? And, and it sort of strikes me that, in a sense, that obviously this is a very polemical series that's trying to counterbalance you know, what, what, is, what you see as a, a very um, unbalanced, dominant narrative. But on the other hand, you know, it is called Oliver Stone's Untold History. And I, and I, and I, you know, I wonder, in a sense, do you, is it, you know, how do you kind of get past this very polarised society? How, how, how do you stop just preaching to the converted, in a sense? Because, you know, the way it's branded, in, in a way, it's sort of... I would worry that it mainly um, appealed to people who are already kind of interested in, in your view of the world. Well, my view of the world has expanded, and the, my viewership can expand, too. <laughs> There's no reason why you cannot reach moderates and people who think for themselves. In fact, I'm very heartened by the reaction to the series. It was unadvertised, and it went out on a premium cable station, but we managed to haul 1.1 million viewers a week, and they hung in there through all 10 chapters the viewership was as high as at the beginning and there's a demand for it on demand and we're also coming out with DVD we sense that this is a, a swelling a swelling uh, viewership and we sense all over the world we're starting to go out, the book's going out you'll see, I'll be back in 5-10 years and uh, you'll see that it's growing like Howard Zinn started much smaller than we did right. and, and uh, can I add to yeah, that and the book was on the New York Times bestseller list for 5 weeks Although it was never reviewed. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in the New York Times, but, uh, but it was on the New York Times bestseller list. The documentary is getting out. 
It is starting to be used in some colleges. We hope to get it into high schools. Mm. But, I, but I think, in a sense, you know, they, they'd wanted the book to be called Oliver Stone's Untold History, and we resisted that because we knew that there were people who were going to say, is this real history or is this Oliver Stone's history? Mm. And so and I think that's a mistake in that sense because, uh, you know, this is not Oliver's history. This is all of our history. That's right. I mean, this is the history of, that's told by the progressive forces in the United States. You know, it we're not... Showtime, they wanted my name all above the title. Yeah. And, you know, thinking a bit like Alfred Hitchcock, okay. <laughs> you got you to gotta make, you got to, you know, why would anybody watch another history program? I suppose that's what they're thinking. So you give it a little bit of an allure. So we played that game, I think, on the film, but on the yeah. book, we left it off. Right, right. it's, not, it's it not on the book. Yeah, on the film we did. And we discussed it because we knew that that was potentially problematic because we want this. I mean, this is, there's been a lot of good historians and a lot of good work, and we're standing on their shoulders. You know, this is something that's based on the top American scholarship, or what we consider the top American scholarship from our vantage point, of the past three, four decades. Now, we see it like Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn was very enthusiastic about our project. And, and we, we see uh, we're actually people who put out a comic book version of Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States are working on a comic book version of the untold history. We want to reach as many different kinds of audiences as possible. Thank you. I think we should come to questions in the, in the center of the, the well, if we've got our two roving mics, and we'll take three. And we have to, they really have to be short questions to the point because we are running very close to time. So if you want to take the gentleman at the front, and then perhaps we'll take uh, the, the hand at the, the back of the well, and then one other, and then the gentleman over there. So you mentioned these twists in history. I'm wondering if Obama is a twist in history, if he is a open door, if he's going to follow the neoconservative line of Israel and Iran, or maybe provoke another war in Korea. Can we take the other two questions. Obama, is Obama a pivot in history? Great question. Yeah, um, the way you showed off with the atomic bomb, it's as if it were built for the Japanese, which is not the case at all. It was built actually for the Germans. Yes. And so I'd like to bring that in a little bit, so to speak, and don't forget that the Germans in the last Eisenberg were just a bad uh, mathematician. Uh, can you go a little louder on that last part? That unless Heisenberg was just a bad mathematician, he had the bomb before we did. So there's, there's the whole question of the bomb to me is, I, it sort of appears as far as you're concerned, it started a lot earlier than that, and there were people who were very much involved in oh, yeah. why they wanted to be going after the but Germans. He, That's my first part of my question. Uh, no, 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 sorry, it has to be the two points. So third question here. I wonder if you can elaborate on the connection between U.S. interventionism in Latin America and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issues you portray in the third chapter, the origins of... Uh, the what? Or, or the, the issues that you portray here in the, in the third chapter of your series, the origins of the Cold War and so on. Uh, I just asked the panel to come to Obama last because I think that would be a really nice final question. If we can take, is Obama a pivot of history is the last question. That would be our, our final question. What's the first one? Uh, well, we have the atomic bomb for Germans right. and uh, about Latin America and the Eastern aspects well, I'll let, of the Well, I'll let Peter answer on the atomic bomb, but I would say to you I have very strong doubts. Uh, there's no question that if we dropped it on Germany at a crucial point, it would have certainly earned the uh, uncompromised, uh, I think, respect of the world. However, I think there was, as someone pointed out earlier, there was a strong anti-racial factor here. And the Japanese were regarded as less than life, less than insects. So there was less qualms about dropping a bomb on Japan than Germany. And I would propose to you the reverse of psychology. What if Germany had used the weapon first? And what if Germany had not won the war and had used the weapon? It would, that weapon, the, the A-bomb, would now be uh, despised through the world. It would, it would be so profaned by the German dropping it that it would never have been questioned. It would never even be questioned for proliferation. I think there would have been some kind of international response alliance to take over the weapon, as was proposed by Stimson and Wallace back in '45. You want to go on about that? Uh, about the nuclear? Yeah, okay, certainly. The, the question of uh, why we started the bomb project, we have Einstein, this should be in this episode where we quote Einstein 
and saying that Einstein sent the letters to Roosevelt. He actually sent three letters. And he said, I made one great mistake in my life, sending the letter to Roosevelt, urging him to begin the bomb project. And that was, had nothing to do with the Japanese. That, the bomb was initially, as we show and we talk about in the book, was seen as a deterrent. It was a deterrent against the idea that the Germans would get a bomb. That's what the emigre scientists who were pushing the United States to develop the bomb feared. What would happen if Hitler got a bomb? And that's you know, obviously something to be very frightened about. And that's why the United States began the bomb project. But we learn in late 1944 in an espionage program called the Alsos Project. Alsos is the Greek word for grove. is named after Leslie Groves. Uh, we went in, into France and we found out that the Germans were, had abandoned nuclear research back in 1942. That Speer and Hitler had decided that it would take two to three years to develop a bomb and it wouldn't be worth the effort. They put their efforts instead into V1 and V2 rockets. So the Germans abandoned the bomb project. We knew that. At what, that point, one person left the bomb project when we found out that the Germans weren't developing a bomb, Joseph Rothblatt, great, great man, who later goes on in 1995 to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, just fabulous man. But he was the only one who left the bomb project at that point. So we built it, we started it to use against the Germans, but after Germany surrendered, we sped it up. As Oppenheimer said, we were under enormous pressure to speed this up, to get this finished by the time of Potsdam. They wanted to be able to test it. They moved Potsdam back two weeks. They wanted to be sure to test it before the Potsdam meeting. And, and so they, and then they, they know how extraordinarily powerful it is. And Churchill says uh, Truman's demeanor changed completely once they got the report on how powerful the bomb was. So it becomes this important factor in that way. Uh, Heisenberg we don't know there's a big debate about what Heisenberg thought Heisenberg was certainly not a bad mathematician responsible for the uncertainty principle he was a brilliant man uh, he later wanted to claim that he never wanted to develop the bomb and he helped sidetrack it the evidence on that is, is somewhat dubious unfortunately but they decided not to develop the bomb and Heisenberg never fought really as much as he might have to develop the bomb they had the capability certainly we have questions also about Obama. Yeah, South America first. Yeah. Just South America, and then we'll finish with Obama. Right. Uh, I don't see any difference uh, with the South American equation and the Middle East equation, except that we were doing South America, Latin America sooner uh, with the Monroe Doctrine. But certainly after the 1900 war, by the way, we annexed Cuba essentially uh, under the Carr Amendment which is to say that all the, the Cubans had revolted against the Spanish Empire and they had earned their independence and we helped them but then we took over the island and we became a business interest and by the time Castro's revolution Cuba was a mostly American owned and run uh, so uh, all this expansion in this taking this running uh, dictatorship putting dictatorships in the Samosas in Nicaragua the coup d'etats that we pulled off, the covert interventions in Chile, in Brazil, in Argentina, encouraging the dirty war, encouraging Operation Condor, encouraging death squads, using our knowledge from Vietnam to ship it to South America. Uh, it's a disgusting, disgusting profile. Kennedy saw through it and tried in perhaps a two week away to do something about it with the Alliance for Progress, but when he was shot in 1963, Lyndon Johnson within days uh, Reinstated, what was it, the Man Act? Man, Man. And he sent James Mann to tell every one of these countries in South America, look, uh, f forget about you know any kind of liberal reform shit. Uh, we got eight billion dollars down here, and we're gonna we we, we we want our interests looked after. And he was a very hardcore man. Johnson talked to the Greek ambassador somewhat in the same way. Listen, you bum, you're a, you're a flea. I'm an elephant. If you want me to step on you, he was talking about Greece in 1967. If you, if you want to get stepped on, just, you know, okay? That's the way Johnson talked. That was America. He's the, he's the bluntest instrument of American policy we've ever seen. And I'm kind of grateful for him for his ugliness in that way. But uh, Nixon was more nefarious and more secretive and obviously bombed more than Johnson, but both have a pretty good record of psychopathic bombing of uh, third world populations. And don't forget the coup in the Dominican Republic. Listen, Latin America is one of the dirtiest stories. It comes up to today, Cuba, Chavez, uh, what's going on now? We're, I'm sure America is still doing the same thing. Nothing has changed. The Honduran coup from two years ago is a disgusting example of American sneakiness in South America. And now, in Central America, and now with this 
you know, obviously Venezuela is a huge regional power with a lot of wealth. This is worth this is worth so much to the United States. We've been pound, pounding on the Chavanistas for 10, 12, 10 years now. He's dead. We didn't bother to send anybody to the funeral. We said in disparaging words about him. His funeral was attended by many heads of state. He's much respected in the world, the other world that exists. So I guarantee you that we're up to no good and we're trying to already fix this next election or do something that's going to destabilize the, the Maduro regime. And you'll see the way we work. Uh, who knows? He died of cancer very young. There's a record of a lot of Latin American leaders getting cancer in the last few years. I wouldn't be surprised at anything anything that happens when it comes to money and the, the importance of regional power in South America. But it's no different what we did in Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, what we did uh, uh, in, uh, in Chile, in Argentina, in Brazil, in, Ang in Angola, and also in, uh, in, don't forget, the Belgian Congo. It's an interesting story, but we can go on and on with this. All over the globe, we, we have worked tried to get our way, often at the expense of many innocent people and lives. Uh, would you like to uh, finish by uh, giving thoughts about, about Obama? Does he fit into the sort of... Uh, go. Is sure. he a hopeful pivot, or has he been sort of subsumed into the sort of a military... Pivot, pivot, pivot is the right word, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Obama's a huge disappointment to us. We both supported him enthusiastically in 2008, holding our nose in 2012, considering the alternative. Uh, the, uh, Obama goes in there, but it, right from the start, we knew something was wrong. If you looked at the people he brought in as his advisors and cabinet members, the foreign policy team, Hillary Clinton, who's a, a, a hawk on almost every foreign policy situation, Robert Gates, the, for, the Republican who stays on, uh, General Jones, I mean, these are not progressive reformers by any means in terms of changing the empire, U.S. foreign policy. His domestic policy team, the New York Times called them a constellation of Rubenites. These are the people who deregulated the economy. These are the all Wall Street people. It's not surprising that his policies, foreign and domestic, were what they've been. But it didn't have to be. Uh, when he first took office, he met with presidential historians, a lot of historians here. And, they get, and so he met with a team of presidential historians that went around the room and he asked for their advice. And one after another said, don't get involved in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is going to be a quagmire. It's going to be your Vietnam. Don't get involved. And what does Obama do? He triples the number of troops in Afghanistan. He doesn't follow their advice. He caves into the military pressure. One of the reasons we admire John Kennedy so much, especially in the last year of his presidency, he stood up to the military. As he called them, the, he, he stood up to those Joint Chiefs sons of bitches and those CIA bastards. You know, uh, and I mean, he, he understood that. Had he gone in, had he followed the, the Pentagon's advice and invaded Cuba, bombed Cuba and invaded in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, much of the world that exists now would no longer be here. And he came that close. As you'll see in our episode on the Cuban Missile Crisis, the U.S. sub was dropping depth charges on a so uh, the U.S. ship was dropping depth charges on a Soviet sub that was carrying nuclear torpedoes, and the the, the commander gave the order to launch the nuclear torpedo. Had the other sub-commander, Arkhipov, not talked him down, then they would have launched, the nuclear war would have started, and much of the world, as we know it, would no longer exist. But Kennedy stood up to his military in that situation. Obama didn't. Obama caved on Afghanistan. He's caved on a lot of these policies. So we think that in some ways, he's a voice of sanity compared to Bush, you know, which is not a very high bar. Uh, but, but compared to Bush, yeah, he looks a lot better than, than Bush. He at least uh, understands that these kinds of policies are nonsensical uh, and that he's pursuing some... some he hasn't gotten sent the troops into Mali and he hasn't sent the troops into Syria yet. Uh, but if you look at the overall thrust of his policy, Nowhere does he critique empire. When he greeted the troops when they came back from Iraq, he told them they had fought this noble war. They'd gone there to help the Iraqi people, and they'd done this wonderful good. So he doesn't even question the empire, and that's what we think is necessary. And when it comes to the national security state, he's doubled down on Bush's policies. He promised to be the transparency president. Well, you know, not, not 
only is he not transparent, he's been worse in a lot of ways. The United States intercepts 1.7 billion emails and telegrams and phone calls a day. Under all presidents from 1917 to 2008, the, the United States had indicted three people under the Espionage Act during that whole time. Obama has indicted seven people under the Espionage Act. We were horrified. We criticized Bush for conducting surveillance without judicial review. Obama's killing people without judicial review, and there's hardly a peep about it. So we think that Obama... You know, maybe it's slightly a step back in some ways, but in terms of what really needs to be done, Obama has been too much of the successor and inheritor of Bush's policies and not enough of the critic and, and changer. You want me to finish? Please. You know, uh, we called him a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, an effective manager. I would just say that in Chapter 10, uh, there's, a, there's a line that describes uh, certainly our feelings about the twist, as you call it. It says, uh, history shows us that the curve of the ball can break differently, again and again. And it is in that hope, you know, that things are never what they seem. You expect the worst, it doesn't look good, but somehow, by some divine mercy, October 20, Sunday, October 27th dawn, that night, Saturday night, many of the officials in the cabinet thought it was over. McNamara among them. The world was at an end. 1962. In 1962. It, Sunday, the light broke. Somehow, the crisis dissolved. I go back to Roosevelt's words to, to Churchill. Most every problem can be resolved. It doesn't have to go to this place. Roosevelt saw clearly Kennedy and Khrushchev, because Khrushchev is a crucial partner, saw that they were losing control of the military. The, the, there was a dawn of mercy. It happens again and again. But, uh, George McGovern runs for office in 72. He loses, he's wiped out, but he still said the right things and did the right things and was a beacon of hope. He could have been elected. In 1976, uh, we all got behind Jimmy Carter. There was a great dawn to his presidency. It's a tremendous hope in New York. I remember that vividly. And uh, things were changing. He announced interesting things. Within two years, he'd been terrified off by, by his... Uh, Brzezinski and the various analysts around him, but he was changed. The same thing happened uh, again with, uh, with uh, Gore in 2000. He won that election, and he should have been president, but it broke differently with the Supreme Court, and Bush inherited this. We, got, we inherited this nightmare from Bush. Uh, Gore would have been a much more far-seen man, but that was how close Obama was that close. In 1989 and 91, Gorbachev and Bush, the father, Gorbachev came out of nowhere. He was an, uh, an agricultural engineer who came out of the Soviet system. We, we thought there'd be another deadbeat, you know, a guy with no brains, a, a Chernenko, a, a, Brezh a Brezhnev. He was a brilliant young man. He saw another world. Robert Kennedy was started out as a conservative, much hated uh, young snotty lawyer turned into a leading liberal for reform. Martin Luther King was a church man, and he came out with his great voice. So it happens again and again, and it will happen again. There's somebody in this room, maybe, who's going to, a young man, a woman who's sitting there, who's going to change the world. It's, and, uh, you know, it's part, we have to hand down hope and freedom and the concept of what we, uh, a concept of history that means something so that we know it for the future. Because there will be moments when it will break again. Who knows, this Chinese prime minister maybe, or some guy in Africa, I don't even know his name, who might show up as a new leader of the world. Don't give up. That's what I have to say. Uh -huh.